Hello to you friends. This is Stammer on Air. But first, the daily, early, Buddhist contemplation. All beings are born and created by the Kama. They are formed, shaped, conditioned, elevated, and restricted by their Kama. These past actions, this past behavior, is a womb of probability from which they re-emerge. All beings are owners of their karma, debtors to their karma, and they inherit their karma. Whatever they do, whether good or bad, the later effects of that will be theirs only. This accumulation of probability follows them like a shadow of the past that never leaves. Therefore does this karma come to divide all beings into high and low, beautiful or ugly. To improve this karmic accumulation, it is therefore crucial to go for refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, and to improve behavior, accept and undertake the five basic Buddhist training rules. Doing so by repeating these following stanzas defines any Buddhist and is the very entry point into the Sangha, the community of Buddhist disciples. The verbal device for taking the three refuges and accepting the five precepts goes like this. As long as this life lasts, I hereby take refuge in the Buddha. I hereby take refuge in the Dhamma. I hereby take refuge in the Sangha. I hereby seek shelter in the Buddha for the second time. I hereby seek shelter in the Dhamma for the second time. I hereby seek shelter in the Sangha for the second time. I hereby request protection from the Buddha for the third time. I hereby request protection from the Dhamma for the third time. I hereby request protection from the Sangha for the third time. The three refuges he has is hereby taken. I hereby accept and undertake the training rule of avoiding all killing. I hereby accept and undertake the training rule of avoiding all stealing. I hereby accept and undertake the training rule of avoiding all sexual abuse. I hereby accept and undertake the training rule of avoiding all dishonesty. I hereby accept and undertake the training rule of avoiding all alcohol and drugs as long as this life lasts. From now on, I can hereby rightly consider myself to be a true Buddhist with a blessed Buddha as my teacher. This Sangha entry can be verified at the Satama Sangha or Sangha entry page at the website what Buddha said.net. Thank you for your understanding and participation.
Hello to you friends. This is Damma on air number 51. Recorded on the 29th December the year 2016 to be sent out as always every Sunday. In this case, Sunday the 1st January 2017. So hang on in there and come to the YouTube channel at Sundays and get your Dhamma. So you can go scot free even in this life and approach Nibbana. There are one simile, one Kama story, and it's a good one, and three questions. But as usual, first the normal intro. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambutasa Worthy Honorable and perfectly self enlightened was Sibless Buddha. As you see, then we're indoor today. And this is because uh, there has been a rainstorm passing here for two days up here on the mountain. There's a first rainstorm here in December. Usually it rains all December. But uh, this December it was fairly good weather. But now some significant rain comes, as you see. 70 millimeters fall this night, and there's uh, 50 millimeters here at midday, noon already. So. 130 millimeters in less than 24 hours. Significant rain. Nevertheless, uh, we spring out into the simile, which is a very famous one and well worth remembering. Uh, I do it myself. When becoming careless and unguarded in the senses, then I remember this simile of the six animals. And it is from the Samyutta Nikaya. Uh, from uh, the book of 35 of this on the six senses, and it's Sutta number 247. It's called The Six Animals. The connected discourses you see here. And the six animals uh, is a story the Buddha he, he invented to explain the necessity of guarding the senses, not letting them run wild as six animals. So he says, suppose a man, he's, he's wounded and it's festering from his wounds. And he goes into a bush and there he rips his wounds and there he, there's thorny creepers there and they, they, they rip his, his festering wounds. So he experiences a lot of pain there, he says. Exactly so it is with, with an immoral monk who's unguarded in his senses, his senses and uh, who keeps secrets and who doesn't live the celibate life. Then whenever he goes into the village and in, around in society where they know him and where they know this uh, bad, secret, uh, hypocritical behavior of his, then they will say, ah, he's a thorn of impurity to this village, this monk. And how, how had it come to be like that? Is this because of this being unguarded in the senses? So seeing a form with the eye, then unguarded one is obsessed with the pleasing forms while being repelled by the unpleasing forms. Smelling a smell, tasting a taste, touching a touch, one is attracted by the agreeable sensations, but repulsed by the disagreeable sensations. Cognizing an idea with the intellect, with the mind. One is attracted by the agreeable ideas and repulsed by the disagreeable ideas. So, Mind is constantly being pulled away or pushed away from balance. 
And he says, this uncontrolled, unguarded mind is like if you catch six animals, a snake, a crocodile, a bird, a duck, a jackal, a monkey, and then bind them all together with a rope and tying a knot in the middle, and then letting go of the bundle of six animals. Then the snake, it will try to escape down into an anthill. The bird will try to fly up in the air. The dog will try to run back to the village. The monkey will go up, try to go up in a forest, a uh, forest tree, and the jackal will go back to the cemetery to ignore a corpse. So they will start pulling in the same rope that is tied together with a knot until one of them become tired or several of them become, become tired. Then whoever is strongest, uh, they will come under sway of this one and then they, the whole bundle will be dragged the way of whoever these six animals was the strongest at any given time point. So they will come under sway and, and, and be dragged away by the strongest. So also is with the senses. If there's a sensor that is particularly attracted to an object or another sensor that is particularly repulsed by another object, then the mind goes where the attraction is and it escapes whatever is disagreeable. But whatever is pleasant and agreeable might not be advantageous. And whatever is repulsive and disagreeable sensation might not be detrimental. It might be what actually what you need to see, to hear, to taste, to touch, to understand. So, if one is like these six animals, under sway of whichever sense attraction and repulsion is strongest in each moment, then, of course, one will tend to behave like a summation of animal behavior. And this, because of this summation of animal behavior, create uh, animal karma, then one is likely to be reborn uh, as an animal or lower at the rebirth moment, if unguarded in the senses. Then there's another case, uh, a man said, he is another man, he, he catches the same animals. Uh, but instead of binding them together and then just letting the bundle go wherever it wants to go, then he takes a bit stake, a post, and hammer deep down in the ground. And then he ties and tethers this bundle of animals to this post. And then they drag around until they become tired, and then they, they stand along the post. This is the first stage. Then after a while, they... they go around a little bit, and then after, even further, they lie down. And then there's another scene here, now it's very peaceful. There's these six senses, there's six, six, six animals, but they lie beside the post. So the post is a symbol or a simile of mindfulness, sati, awareness of what the senses is doing and where they want to go and not letting them, them go necessarily where they want to go, not letting them escape from where they want to escape. So this mind has control over its sensors. It has control over its inputs. It's, if a computer doesn't have control over its inputs, then the output calculation, the behavior, the intention is completely uncontrollable, con completely uncontrollable. This mind runs amok. It runs wild like a horse, wild, 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 and then over the cliff and down and goes. So the mind is like these six senses. This, how to do this actually? Yes, those who can do this, they have practiced two things. They are not attracted by sensations, whether by agreeable sounds or smells or touches, touches or tastes or mental states or ideas. Why not? 
because they have for a long time practiced kayagatasati, mindfulness immersed in the body, or awareness of the body as a corpse, as a skeleton, as something rotting, as something repulsive. So all this desire for sensuality, this has gone away. They're still sensing, they still have their inputs, but they're not obsessed, obsessed by them. They're not taken in by violent feelings, running after pleasant feeling uh, and away from painful feeling, and neglecting neutral feeling caused by these sensations. They're not, they're not. At the same time, they have also no aversion towards feeling pain or disagreeable sensations. Why not? Because they stay in the infinite mind. The infinite mind is infinite friendliness, boundless compassion, exalted rejoicing in others' success, and completely undisturbed, imperturbable serenity or equanimity, upekka. So these four Appamanya Brahma Vihara, these four infinitely divine states, if one st stays within them and have done that for a long time, then one's aversion, one's repulsion, tendency to be repulsed by different sensations, which are flooding the mind all the time, in each second. You're flooded by both painful, agreeable and disagreeable and pleasant uh, sensations and also neutral sensations. They're flooding the mind all the time. So if this mind is on autopilot, then it will just go for the feeling, whatever feeling, pleasure, pain, or neutral feeling that is connected with this sensation. If it's not on autopilot, if it's aware, then it just looks at it and see and comprehends what it is without being raped by its own emotions. Thereby, it has broken this obsession with sensation in general. I hope uh, you also will, when you go around, just before you go out into the kitchen and open the fridge, or turn on another pornographic movie, or romantic uh, comedy, or uh, a piece of music, uh, or uh, go to a restaurant and eat, or uh, under other sways of sensation that you are reminded by this simile of the six animals that are tied together in a bundle and then come under sway of which animals, which animal is the strongest while fleeing back to the jungle or down into the ant hill or up into the air or into the cemetery to gnaw corpses. Remember this simile of the six animals, to learn to guard the senses, guarding the senses, control the senses, not thereby being controlled by whatever circumstance and sensations uh, come drifting by, not being in the sway or under control of one's emotional reactions on different perceptions and experiences and sensations. So much for simile of the six animals. 15 minutes and 56 seconds in. Question 168. What is the alaya consciousness in regard to mind and mental defilements? Yes, the alaya consciousness is also called the storehouse consciousness or where uh, all embodying consciousness. It's a late concept. I will think it's, a, it's I think it's a failed concept. It's from a very late school. It's 800 years after uh, the Buddha's death. We just sum up here, uh, the Buddha died uh, 483 BC, uh, and then there was three councils, uh, uh, which the uh, last one was uh, by King Asuka, which you see a picture of here, and Mogaliputta, Tera, and then the fourth was here on Sanaka, where the Tipitaka was written down, not far from here, up in uh, Matale region in a cave monastery. And this happened, all, all this happens 400 years before this Yogacara school 
in India emerged, which was led by a philosopher called, called Vasubandhu, which had this problem that he could not explain to himself or to his pupils or to his supporters when this karma is, uh, you're doing this karma and it doesn't fall out immediately, where is it stored? Where is it actually? Uh, so it's not, is it inside the mind or where is it? Is it outside? They, they, they didn't know that. If it's not falling out immediately, this karma, this influence, where is it then? And to this purpose, they then uh, made a rewriting of Buddhist philosophy. Instead of saying that it was six uh, kind of consciousness, then they said there were eight kind of consciousness. Huh? So normally this is a visual consciousness, auditory consciousness, gustatory consciousness, olfactory consciousness, tactile consciousness, and mental consciousness, corresponding to each of the six senses. Then they took this mental consciousness and said, ah, okay, this we divide up into three. There's a mental consciousness, and then uh, there's a, a self-consciousness where, where ego perception uh, and egoistic clinging resides. And then there's a, these two are active, and then there's a storehouse a, a consciousness, which is not active. And that's where these influences, these karmic uh, memories, uh, or shadows, or echoes, they are stored. This was their idea. So the idea was that this storehouse consciousness accumulates all potential energy from mental and physical manifestations of one existence, Nama Rupa, for a later time. And thereby also it induces uh, transmigration and rebirth at the rebirth moment. These are all stored there. It's causing origination of new existence uh, which will ripen into future experience. It's constantly present, constantly operating, and it persists until attainment of awakening. It is a container of past experiences and karmic action in the form of bija or seeds. So they thought there are some elements in there inside this storehouse consciousness, and it's called seeds. And they may produce future later on. The fundamental consciousness of all sentient beings, as defined by Yoga Kara school, a liar means storehouse, implying that this consciousness contains and preserves all past memories and potential psychic energy within its fold. It is a reservoir of all ideas, memories, and desires, and is also a fundamental uh, cause of both samsara and nibbana. Now we have, a, now is, they say it's the cause of nibbana. Clearly, uh, not orthodox thinking. Later on, other schools which spilled over into uh, China, uh, Mahayana Buddhism and uh, Zen Buddhism of uh, Japan, they thought that the, uh, the Buddha nature, the ability to be enlightened, uh, the Tathagata Garpa thought, uh, they were, this was embedded somewhere inside the storehouse consciousness. However, when one looks at it from above, and then one becomes a little bit suspicious because uh, the Buddha said there is no self, that there's nothing that is permanent, uh, neither inside nor outside. So now we have a, a something called consciousness, and that is apparently seems to be permanent. And it's, whether it's inside or outside is not said, but uh, it looks like a, a permanent invariant self. The, the Atman notion of, of Hinduism where there is a kind of self that is everywhere present, operating at all times, uh, which creates everything, from which everything springs. This is the Atman. Or it could be the primordial essence, the Prakti, uh, that is creating everything. This is basic uh, Hindu ideas. And this is typical of uh, when time goes by, the Buddha died 483, this 800 years after his death, these ideas emerged. Why? Because understanding has gone down, and when understanding goes down, then ritualism and superstition goes up. So understanding goes down, then ritualism goes up. And lack of understanding, blind superstition. And this is typical that other ideas from uh, is, is kind of like borrowed from 
from neighbor religions, in this case, uh, Hinduism. So, however, one has to dig a little bit deeper than these very romantic uh, Hindu-like uh, superstitions about uh, some primordial uh, holistic uh, dream nature that is in this case embedded as a storehouse consciousness. Why so? Because the Buddha say specifically that Sabbadamma anatta, all states are no self. There's no essence to be found, neither inside nor outside. Whether, whether consciousness or not, there's no essence, there's no self. There's no source from British, from which it springs. Sabha, Sankara, Anicca, all constructions are impermanent. This means that they cannot, these phenomena, these constructions, they cannot be stored. There's nothing to store. And few, furthermore, there, there's nothing within it can be stored. There's no storehouse. And these seeds also, they cannot be stored. They are not permanent. They, they are not lasting as entities, static entities. They are influences that are under constant modification. Sabha Sankara, Dukkha, that uh, all phenomena basically are suffering. If this should go for this, uh, this uh, storehouse consciousness, then the Buddha nature should also be suffering. Because this is basically a construction. Huh? And so there uh, you, you run into problems there, serious problems. Huh? Nothing persists. Everything, any consciousness included, is momentary and thus impermanent. So it doesn't exist forever, it exists only for one moment. How can it be a storehouse then? And what is it that is momentary inside that is stored? So this lack of understanding of how ultra-acute impermanence is, blinking states lasting only one Planck moment, corresponding to 5.6 times 10 to the minus 43 seconds. <laughs> you cannot keep anything, not even for a billionth of a second. So how can you make a storehouse of it? Huh? It's absurd. So these ideas should be given up. This is not uh, orthodox Buddhism. This is uh, something uh, Vesubanduism, uh, aching to Hinduism, and it's, it's, it's not Buddhism. If we go to Back to, as these problems uh, arise, we should, once it all goes back to, what did the Buddha say about this issue? And he said, for example, on the all, this also goes for this all from which they claim everything springs. Because I will teach you the all, listen to that. And what because is the all? It is the eye and the forms, the ear and the sounds, the nose and the smells, the tongue and the tastes the body and the touches, and the mind and the mental states. This defines and establishes the all. If anyone, Bhikkhus, should ever postulate this, having denied this all, I will define and po point out another all. That would be empty babble. If he was questioned, he would not be able to reply, and he would become quite perplexed. Why so? Because, because that would be far out of his mental range. And this I think we can say for Mr. Vasubandhu uh, from the 8th century, uh, or 4th century, sorry, uh, after Christ, 800 years after Buddha, that he tries to define another all. And he's not really clear about what he's talking about. Uh, but still these ideas are hanging on in Mahayana Buddhism. But uh, I'd like to say uh, specifically and emphasize this has nothing to do with the historical Buddha Siddhartha Gautama or any other enlightened being from the past. Nor will any future Buddha speak of such a storehouse consciousness, for sure. So uh, there you got it, it's heterodox thinking, it's half Hinduism, neither more nor less. This is from the Samyutta Nikaya also. Furthermore, if we take this all, the sabbe, 
all phenomena, little further. Then he said, in this Pahayana Sutta, to be given up, monks, I will teach you the all as a phenomenon to be given up. Listen and pay close attention. As you say, Lord, the monks responded. The blessed one then said, and what is this phenomena, all that should be given up? The eye should be given up, form should be given up, visual consciousness should be given up, contact at the eye, eye contact should be given up, visual consciousness should be given up, forms should be given up, and whatever there is that arises in dependence upon this contact at the eye, eye contact, whether experienced as pleasure, pain, or neither pleasure nor pain, that also should be given up. The ear should be given up. Sounds should be given up. The nose should be given up. Aroma should be given up. The tongue should be given up. Flavors should be given up. The body should be given up. Tactile sensation should be given up. The intellect should be given up. Ideas and mental states should be given up. Mental consciousness should be given up. Intellectual contract should be given up. And whatever there is that arises in dependence on this intellectual mental contact, whether experienced as pleasure, pain, or neither pleasure nor pain, that too should be given up. This is called the all as a phenomenon that should be given up. Samyutta Nikaya, book 35, speech number 24. So there you see all the visual consciousness there is, or the consciousness there is, visual consciousness, auditory consciousness, olfactory consciousness, gustatory consciousness, tactile consciousness, and mental consciousness. They're talked about here as something that should be given up. Something that should be eradicated, left behind. Why so? Because they are dukkha. Why so? They're suffering. Because they are impermanent, anicca. So there no storehouse consciousness appears. He never mentioned this word. Never. I hope this bori, uh, this romantic, uh, naive, semi-Hindu thinking about where this influence is. The comic influence which we, we see from, from a normal contemporary quantum mechanical physical point of view, then it's a field of probability. But the concept of probability and uh, the concept of a field, like a field of gravity or a field of magnetism, and in this case a field of probability, which you see here, a, a visual representation of a field of probability of an electron entering a metal surface which is positively charged. So the red color is, is, is located on a probability that that represents a large chance, a large probability for the electron entering right there in the metal sheet under it. While the blue color is low probability. So these probabilities, though not visible, they are around us. And they are specific for our consciousness, which has a specific frequency. And that's where the comic influence is stored. It is everywhere present. It is not inside the head or inside the mind. It's a universal feature that is non-local, embedded in the entire universe instantaneously from the moment any thinking or any intention is born. So it's a field of probability and not a storehouse consciousness that embeds the karmic influence. So far uh, about this storehouse uh, business, we go to question uh, 169, which goes like this. Does a stream engine struggle with lust, porn, masturbation, anger and sadness? The short answer is yes. And why is it actually so? 
uh, though the struggle is not so forceful as it is in non-noble individuals, uh, it is so because there's only three failures that is given up by the stream entrant. We'll go through this again because this is a recurring question. Through the path of stream winning, Sotapati Maka, one becomes free from three fetters, three mental chains, of which there is five, five lower and five higher. Five lower is what we're dealing with here. These mental chains, Samyoyana, which bind beings to existence in the sensu sphere, in the Kama Loka, in the lowest eleven levels, we are human or level five, where they all run after sense desire. There are six animals are, are running wild, all of them, in these six lower levels. Oh, 11 lower levels, sorry. So there's a six levels higher than us, where they also dominated by sense desire. This is called karma loka. Karma after sense desire. So the first one is personality belief, psychiatry, that this I am, I am my body or my perceptions or my thoughts. Or, or this is what I'm made of, personality belief. Two is skeptical doubt in the Buddhist Vichikitsa, in, uh, in the Buddhist enlightenment, if one doubts that this was a perfect enlightenment. And three, clinging to mere rules and rituals, Silabhata Paramasa. If one goes one step further up the ladder of noble type two, this 50% uh, enlightenment, through the path of one's return, Sakatagami Maka, one becomes nearly or half free from the fourth and fifth mental chains, which is four sense desire, sensual lust, Kama Chanta or Kama Raga, and five ill will, Vyapata Dosa, is a derivative of hate and anger. So it is these two last ones, the porn and the masturbation, and also the sadness, the lust uh, and anger, these are coming all from this sense desire and this ill will. And this sense desire and ill will, uh, stream entrant has not uh, diminished any of those. He has bro broken through three other hindrances, but not sense desire and ill will. The next what happens is, that then he becomes a Sagatagami, a once returner, then he has reduced sense desire and ill will 50%. When they are eradicated full, completely, then he's, he's an Anagami, and, and no returner. Through the path of non-return, Anagami Maka, one becomes fully free from sense desire and ill will also. As we mentioned, returned, Sotapanna has maximum seven lives left before enlightenment. He or she cannot be reborn in hell as a ghost, as an animal, nor as an angry demon, and is therefore free from the danger of coming downfall. And that's the main scope of attaining stream entry. It is becoming safe from coming downfall. One can never be reborn lower than human in the last seven lives. Having cultivated the noble eightfold way, a being might enter the stream, which leads to Nibbana. This stream entry is entirely free from rebirth as animal, hungry ghost, angry demon, and the ultimate catastrophic destiny, burning hell being. Such noble one, Arya, will be enlightened within seven rebirths at most, either as a human or as a deva. The stream entry has eliminated all egoism. He has no belief in a person or in a self. He has eradicated all eye-making, all mind-making, and abolished all skeptical doubt in the complete perfect self-enlightenment of the historical Buddha. He has also removed any silly superstitious belief in any benefit of empowerments and empty rituals. Such noble one have direct momentary experienced, touched, and tasted the deathless Nibbana and is forever hereafter independent of any teacher, any Dhamma teacher. It's from Fruits of the Noble Way, Dhamma Drop, on the website whatbuddhaset.net. I'll give the link below. 
the blessed Buddha once said, Bhikkhus and friends, these four things, when developed and cultivated, lead to the realization of the fruit of stream entry. What for? One, association with excellent persons, Mahapurisa. Two, hearing and learning the true Dhamma. You're doing that right now. Three, rational and careful attention. Yuniso Manasikara. Four, praxis in accordance with the Dhamma. That's the job here. These four things, when developed and cultivated, lead to the realization of the fruit of stream entry, lead to the realization of the fruit of one's returning, lead to the realization of the fruit of non returning lead to the obtaining of understanding, to the growth of understanding, to the expansion of understanding, lead to great understanding, extensive understanding, waste understanding, deep understanding, matchless understanding, wide understanding, rich understanding, quick understanding, buoyant understanding, joyous understanding, leads to swift understanding, sharp understanding, penetrative understanding, transcendent understanding. These four things lead to great wisdom. What for? One, association with excellent persons. Two, hearing and learning the true Dhamma. Three, Rational and careful attention. Four, praxis in accordance with the Dhamma. These four things, when initiated and trained, lead to the penetrative understanding. These four things, when completed, lead to the very final fruit of Arahantship, awakening into enlightenment, the very deathless dimension. They lead to Nibbana. This also from the group sayings, uh, Connected Discourses, The Fruits of Stream Entry, Book 55 from the Samyutta Nikaya, which you see here. And these five mental chains which we are discussing here, of which the three first is uh, eliminated by a stream entry, but not the two last, which is sense desire and ill will, which is dominant, I would say, in most beings. The Blessed Buddha, he often emphasized that there are these five lower chains. What five? The mental chain of belief in my same identity. Sakayaditi. I am the same person. I have an identity. The mental chain of skeptical doubt. Michikicha. The mental chain of clinging to rule and ritual. Silabhatta Paramasa. The mental chain of lust for sensuality. Kamaraga. The mental change of anger and ill will, Vyabhada. There exist these five lower mental change. The noble eightfold way should be developed for the direct experience of these five minor mental chains. For the full understanding and elimination of them, and for their final overcoming, destruction, and full abandonment. This noble eightfold way is developed for the breaking asunder all of these five minor mental chains. Also from the Samyutta Nikaya. So, a stream internet has broken three chains, but need to break two more to go into the state of a non-returner, 50% enlightened. This might take lives, it might take seconds, but it needs to be done. Question 170. Are there sure signs of approaching the first jhana absorption? This is also a classic question. We have gone through it uh, many times before. Uh, what is the first jhana? So I, I like to repeat uh, what has been said in the other ones also. First, uh, jhana is the first jhana is the first mental absorption. Jhana is a Pali word. In Sanskrit, it's dhyana. In Chinese is Chan, and it's the founding word of Chan Buddhism, and in Japanese is Sen, and it's also the founding word of Zen Buddhism. What are the preliminaries outside of meditation for accessing or 
uh, gaining this first jhana absorption, which is exceedingly pleasant and uh, surprising and overwhelming and a kind of breakthrough for any meditator. The first is purified morality, which leads to clear conscious innocence and mental elation. And it's guarding the senses, as we've been speaking on already, which means to absence of temptation, greed, desire and attraction. And it's clear comprehension as acute awareness and absolute and acute mental presence. And then it's contentment, calm and still satisfaction, even with nothing, joy and happiness. These requisites are necessary because the proximate cause of jhana to occur is happiness, sukha. And you cannot be happy if you've done something evil, because then there's regret and remorse. And regret and remorse cannot be present in the mind at the same time as happiness. So if there's regret and remorse, then there's no happiness. If there's happiness, then there's no regret and remorse. So this has to be eliminated first. And this requires, of course, purified morality. Then there's these five mental hindrances, nivaranas, they should be absent. And then there's, so there's five things that should be absent and five things that should be present. And these are the 10 causal factors, classic causal factors of jhana absorption. So the approximate acute momentary causes are one, absence of sense desire of anything. It's desire to see something, hear something, taste something, touch something, think something, smell something. Absence of that. Absence of any ill will, aversion or irritation. Absence of all lethargy and laziness. Absence of restlessness and regret. And absence of doubt and uncertainty. So this should not be there. Then jhana can occur, absorption can occur. Then there are five things that should be there. Presence of directed thought. And two, sustained thinking. Presence of thrill, joy, piti. And pleasurable happiness, sukha. And presence of unified, single-pointed focus. Ikka, gatta, chitta. Mind going only one place. So if these five things are there, and the other five things, the five hindrances, mental hindrances, are absent, then, clack, jhana occurs. If we express it as ten factors, then it's full self-control gained by purifying morality. Why so? Because this will mean absence of regret and remorse, and this again will mean means presence of happiness. Guarding the sense doors, moderating in eating, wakefulness as night, and the prior preliminary work with any meditation object, mastery in directing mind to the sign of absorption, mastery in attaining the first calm and then unified focus, mastery in determining the duration in advance, mastery in emergence from this exalted state, and then mastery in reviewing the qualities of this state and then remembering them to make it into a sign. One, Remembers. It's like a signpost inside the mind. How is this mental state actually? Then when one has made the signpost very clear and painted it very clear with the qualities, the tastes, the touches of jhana, then one can find back to this signpost because one has made this signpost, this nimitta, this sign, by remembering it. Additional supporting factors are a clean body and a clean dwelling place, skill in remembering and extending the sign, skill in restraining the distracted mind, skill in calming the agitated mind, skill in encouraging the bored mind, skill in observing the well-working mind, avoiding scatterbrained uh, distracted persons with attention deficit, while frequenting and uh, making friendship with well-focused persons, reviewing the liberations and the jhanas uh, frequently, and then resolute determination to succeed in attaining jhana. These are the additional factors that determines whether one has success, which few has in this uh, task of attaining jhana. 
So these are the necessary, sufficient and enabling factors uh, and acting as preliminary requisites for attaining the first jhana. How is the subjective experience? Is this is an intense presence and awareness. It is effortless, undistracted, undistracted and focused thinking. Attention is anchored evenly at ease at any chosen object. Mind is fixed and unified. And the final end result of any chain of reasoning is always reached quickly and successfully. The body is without any pain and is felt like being a flying feather inside a big, empty, silent cathedral. There's joy, bliss and happiness mixed into solid calm, just like a smiling mountain. So a good point to repair, a good, a good symptom, safe symptom is, is the physical pain. If one can feel any physical pain in the knee or wherever, in the teeth or by uh, in whatever part of the body, then it's not first jhana. If one cannot feel any physical pain, then it might be first jhana. One cannot feel, one, one loses the ability by the first jhana to feel any physical pain whatsoever. And that's of course very pleasant, especially if you have problems with the knee by sitting or uh, pain in the back or what it can be, especially after having sit uh, long hours. There's several stages. One is directing, one adverts to this sign of serenity. Two is attaining entrance and stabilizing that entrance. Stage three is prolonging and controlling the duration of having entered the door to, end, to jhana. And four is emergence from absorption, and five is reviewing, looking back on, and then remembering, thereby reinforcing this sign, uh, the nimitta of absorption. So one can find back to the same state, mental state again, by looking actively for the sign. The grades, there are three grades. Uh, one is momentary concentration, which are present uh, also in normal states of mind, Kanika Samadhi. Then there's access concentration, uh, like being in the neighborhood or approaching. It's called Upachara Samadhi. And then there's full absorption, where one enters and remains in that state for more than a split second, typically of minutes to hours to days. Full absorption concentration, fixed and anchored on the object, Appana Samadhi. The meditation techniques or objects which can uh, uh, induce jhana absorption are one, awareness of breathing, anapanasati, which can induce all four jhanas, lower jhanas, rupa jhanas. Uh, kasina meditation, which can induce the first jhana. Uh, Kayagata sati, so that is organ and uh, skeleton and corpse meditation, which also can induce the first jhana. Then there's the four infinite and divine states, the Brahma Vihara, that is again friendliness, infinite friendliness, infinite compassion, infinite rejoicing joy, and infinite equanimity. This can respectfully induce first, second, third, and fourth jhana. And then there's the four fourth states, the infinitude of space, the infinitude of consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. They can induce the four formless jhanas, higher jhanas. The Buddha and the jhanas goes like this. He said, having momentarily eliminated the five mental hindrances of sense desire, ill will, laziness, restlessness, and doubt, which all are defiling imperfections of the mind, that obstruct concentration and understanding. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, separated from disadvantageous mental states, one enters and remains in the first jhana, 
of directed and sustained thought, joined with joy and pleasure, born of secluded solitude. One makes this joy and pleasure, born of secluded solitude, pervade, perfuse, and fill the entire body, so that all parts is thrilled by this joy and pleasure, born of secluded solitude. Even as a clever barber or his apprentice would put soap powder in a brass basin, sprinkle it with water, and gradually knead it and moist it into a ball of foam soaked thoroughly everywhere inside out, yet without dripping. So too does one pervade, perfuse, and fill the entire body so that no part is not completely drenched with joy, pleasure, born of secluded solitude. That's what he said. So, this joy and pleasure, piti and sukha, this one should fill up the body until it's out in the tips of the fingernail and it's out in the hair of the eyebrows, the tip of the hair of the eyebrows, and out in the tips of the small little toenail, not to speak of the arms and the chest and all other body parts. One should fill it up pervade it, perfuse it with this joy and pleasure. This has this functional importance that this joy and pleasure, it is what induced the jhana. Then mind is satisfied. It doesn't want to go anywhere else because now it has what it wants, pleasure and joy. So therefore it stays on the object. It doesn't want to go anywhere else. It don't need to go anywhere else. And therefore it stays anchored well-focused, unified, on the same object from one moment to the next moment to the next moment to the next moment. Instead of having a thousand objects in mind per second, then it has only one object in mind each second, the very same object. And that gives a specific taste and very large efficacy of the thinking regarding this object. There's a big uh, classic manual, it's called The Path of Purification, Visuddhi Magga. It is free on my website, I give it below, it's 800 pages, it's a brick like that. Then there's, uh, it's very neatly summarized in a, also free, the jhanas in Theravada Buddhist meditation by uh, Venerable Mahathira Hinebula Gunaratana. It's the wheel, uh, Buddhist publication society, wheel number 351-253, uh, and it's also given uh, freely as a PDF file on my website, I will give the link below. I can recommend that because that's only 50 pages, 75 pages. And it's again the Jhanas in Theravada Buddhist Meditation, wheel number 351 PDF at net. if you want to know something about absorption. How to attain the Jhana absorptions? I'll give seven links below also. Uh, on what Buddha said, Danet, which explains all about the jhanas. 55 minutes and 40 seconds. Now, we are free to the, the Kama story. There's only one this time. Why so? Because it's a story about uh, Ikadama Savanya Tera. He was an Arahant. And Ikadama uh, Savanya means that he has heard Dhamma only one time one time only, once only. And the story about him uh, was that he has received his name, Ikka Dhamma, because he has one insight by hearing the Dhamma once only. So in the time of a Buddha called Patumutara Buddha, which was also him who gave the first uh, prediction of the next Buddha, Buddha Mutsaya, he was a great a Jatila of great power. And so he was, uh, he could fly, he could elevate, and he came flying through the air. And then suddenly he stopped, but he didn't want to stop. But so he was very, uh, he was puzzled by that. I came flying through the air and then block, it was like I hit a wall, but I, there was no wall. And then he looked down, then he saw the Buddha, Patumacara, he was sitting down speaking there. So he descended and uh, 
listened to this sermon and which dealt with impermanence of all constructions, of all conditioned phenomena, Anicca, and then returning to his hermitage, he meditated on this topic, impermanence. So he heard only one speech on impermanence. He returned, and then from that, he, he was born in the Tabahimsa heaven uh, and became a king there for 51 times, having heard the Dhamma on impermanence only once. Furthermore, when he descended uh, much later, uh, thousands of billions of years later, came down to the human state, he became king of the humans, had a, had a kingdom and a title of a king for 21 times. Then in this, his last life, uh, his father invited a monk to their house while he was a boy. And then this monk gave a speech about impermanence. And then just by hearing this speech, he became enlightened. He enlightened as an anand. And there he was only seven years old. He was one of the three boys that was only seven years old when they got enlightened, attained the enlightened state. And he, while sitting there, he, didn't, he, he saw his, he became enlightened while hearing this monk speak inside his father's house and remembered all his prior lives and his attainments um, as king, king. He was king 21 times and 51 times he was king of the devas, the Tavahimsa devas. Then he remained the, remembered these attainments and these prior lives. And then seated there, while only seven years old, he reached enlightenment, arahantship. So in some cases, this is from the Apadana, uh, book two, page 385, in the Pali text, which you see here, it's not translated yet. I'm also toying with an idea about translating this text, which is a text of the prior lives of many of the big uh, monks uh, and the Buddha also, and other disciples at the Buddha's time their prior lives, their, their rebirth stories from long time back, and thereby also the karmic effects that brought them to enlightenment, what they did to become enlightened under the Siddhartha Gautama Buddha 2,500 years ago. I think that ends Dhamma on air, uh, number 51, once only, like this, Ikka Dhamma, Savanya, Tera, which needed to hear only about impermanence twice in his samsaric career, then he could do the rest himself. Not bad, not bad. Well done, Sadhu, we have to say to Ikadamma Savaniya Tera. Remember to click subscribe uh, down there. And if you want to support this forest sangha and this dhamma sharing, which is going out to uh, 100,000 people at least uh, three times a week, then hover over this region and click, and there will come a small eye, and then there's a drop-down menu with five items for support or for further information on the website whatbuddhaset.net. Then I'd also like to say thank you to all the donors, in particular those who uh, donated food last time. Thank you very much for that. It is needed every fortnight. This can also be done on the website whatbuddhaset.net. And to the other donors and to the regular donors also, all supporters, thank you very much. Your support is very appreciated. And also I think it means an advantage. Uh, a small story could be that yesterday, in a furious rain weather, a person who, a single person who lives in Australia, he had visited here six years ago. And then he had got these uh, Dhamma drops by email and by radio and so on, and by YouTube uh, for six years. And now he was returning here uh, up to the Kuti. And I could not remember him actually, first when I saw his face. So the, the Dhamma comes back, comes back as a good echo, like for 
the monk who became enlightened much, much later from hearing about impermanence, transience, instability, anicca, only once. Thank you for your attention. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Worthy Honorable and perfectly self enlightened was blessed Buddha. May you and all beings from hearing this Dhamma also experience a happy, successful, elevating and wise 2017. Thank you. You heard Bhikkhu Samaita from the Cypress Hermitage on the Knuckles Mountain, Pamparella, Central Hill Country, Sri Lanka. Please subscribe to the Google group Buddha Direct and visit the website What Buddha Said.net. May all beings become thus happy thereby. Thank you. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Worthy, honorable, and perfectly self enlightened was the blessed Buddha. As the next Buddha, the noble Arya Ajitta Mateya will say, you can come as you like, but you pay as you go. Thank you for your contribution and have a nice 2017.